You just got devastating news. Um, you just heard that your child will be born with structural heart disease. That means surgery. And surgery of a tiny heart that's not fully formed yet. And therefore, very hard, a procedure that's high risk with all kinds of possible outcomes. So how can AI help in such a terrible situation? So the first step is that what we're doing today already is we can create a complete model of the heart, even if it's a tiny heart. We can look at the structure of the heart, we can look at the flows within the heart and actually create that physiological model of the heart, which will then allow the surgeon to exactly pinpoint how the surgery is going to take place. Now let's take the next step. What if we can use the same model to create a virtual reality that simulates the surgery and therefore the surgeon can play it out in front of herself before she actually will do the surgery. Not far-fetched once you have the model. Now what if that surgery is supported by a robot and guided by the surgeon? And with every surgery, the robot learns more and more about the procedure. So that the procedure, the models, the pathways can be shared with any surgeon around the world. What if that robot ultimately performed the surgery? These are not far-fetched scenarios and they start with what we're doing already today. They start with creating these 4D models. Now this beautiful young woman is my daughter, my daughter Kim. And 12 years ago, um, actually it's more than 12 years, 15 years ago, I got the phone call that every parent will dread. I got the call that said, we have to rush your daughter to the hospital. You know, she's completely dehydrated and her blood sugars are out of this orbit. So we rushed her to the emergency room where she spent a couple of days to find out that our lives had changed. Type 1 diabetes is a serious condition. It leads to complications, heart complications, kidney complications, eyesight. It changed her life. Every day she has to take 200 decisions. She not only has to check her blood sugars multiple times a day, she has to apply the right level of insulin, which is dependent on her stress levels, on what she's been eating. Then she needs to be supported by multiple medical disciplines, not just a diabetes nurse, but a nutritionist, a psychiatrist. I found out that 60% of the young women that suffer from this genetic disease actually have anxiety, have eating disorders related to the disease. Yet the care is entirely in her hands. She is today the data aggregator. She is today the care coordinator. What if we can use this technology to help her make the right decisions? What if we can couple her continuous glucose meter with an insulin pump what if we can track her stress levels and understand what she eats so that we can guide her to her personalized space where we, she feels well? What if we can see the issues that are associated with this disease um, emerge early so that we can intervene at the right time? What if we can actually aggregate this information and find out the genetic markers that indicate predisposition for the disease? What if we can aggregate data across all gi gi juvenile diabetic patients and find out what actually triggers the disease? Then we can start helping prevent the disease. What if we can use genetics and CRISPR to actually modify the T cells in the body 
that screw up our immune system so that we can allow her to create insulin producing cells again. This is going to happen. And it's going to happen based on artificial intelligence, on the link of continuous clinical trials with extensive population health. Because we're addressing the biggest diseases of all time. We're addressing the fact that 80% of the care cost is associated with chronic disease. And chronic disease never comes alone. Chronic disease is there 24-7 a day and not just on an appointment with a doctor. And one of two people, so most of us, will be diagnosed with cancer in our lifetime. More than 400 million people have either juvenile diabetes like my daughter or they have type 2 diabetes. And every year, 1.5 million people will die of diabetes each year. So we have an issue in our healthcare system. We have an issue that we can solve. We have to switch the system towards being continuous, to becoming preventative, to becoming personal and precise. And that's the challenge we have ahead of us. This is a picture of Joost. Joost is actually here in the room with me. Joost is on my team. He was diagnosed with Crohn's disease. He spent multiple months of his life in the hospital. He spent more than a year, you know, getting to a state where he could go back to work. But he's still at high risk. He's still at high risk of developing colon cancer because this is immune disease that actually affects inflammation of the bowels. It's the same pattern as type 1 diabetes. He has been genetically dispo disposed to the disease, but something triggered it. So now we can check if his son has the same genetic makeup so that we can help prevent onset of the disease. We can start looking at data like Yoast's clinical data compare it and start finding the patterns and the trends that may prevent the disease and ultimately cure the disease. So what we're doing here is essentially creating a full model of you, a digital twin, but not just a digital twin of who you are now, it's essentially the movie of your life is where you're coming from. So actually, not you, but even your parents and your grandparents, which we can read from your genome. The diseases and the medical events you had during your life, which we can read from images and from tests. And what if we combine all of that information and we combine it with behavioral information? Because we all know that behavior is a bigger indicator of health than anything else. So that combination of your genome, your history, your behavior, can tell us a lot about your risks. And if we know about your risks, if we know about your health drivers, we can become much better and proactively help you live a healthy life. And should disease happen, should disease happen, we can become very precise in the diagnosis and we can do it first time right and find the therapy that fits with you. And we can do that for cancer. When we link what we see on an image, we can actually see now how aggressive the cancer is, how it's quantified. We can link it to the pathology, the cell structure, and we can link it to the genetic code of the cancer. And cancer is a disease of cells which is very personal. So now we bring that together and that will lead to the right therapy for you. Now what happens if there's no cure but there might be for future generations? What if we can find Alzheimer's 10 years or 7 years before you see the symptoms? And if we can then find a cure that actually resolves the disease before those symptoms happen. This is something we're working on with some of the leading research institutions. So what we're doing is we're actually looking at 
several studies yeah here we go so what we're doing we're doing several brain MRs in a row and from these brain MRs we quantify the brain we quantify the brain and we look at atrophy and here's you know something I learned all our brains are shrinking um, but it's are they shrinking more than normal? So you cannot see it on an image. Even the best radiologist in the world will not be able to see this. But now we can quantify it, we can compare it to normal, and we see brain atrophy that's larger than normal. First indicator. Then we start looking for tiny little specks, you know, I would say pixels that the human eye cannot see. These may be the first indications of plaque. Now, if we combine those two, you have a high probability of developing Alzheimer's way before you see the symptoms of the disease. Now, there is some research ongoing that can only address the disease before you get the symptoms. So now we can see that you get those symptoms and we can start looking at the right interventions and finding the right treatment ahead of time. So care is becoming personal, it's becoming proactive, and it will allow us to intervene way before you start to suffer. It becomes even more interesting if we aggregate this, if we look at all the causes of Alzheimer's, all the causes of um, dementia, and we start looking at those brains. We create the model of the brain, and not just, you know, again, the structure, which we can do in an MR, but also the electrical flows in the brain for instance, with an EEG. And we merge those modalities to create that model of the brain. We start comparing the brain with millions of other brains, literally connecting brains. And then we start seeing things that will help us also to find the cures for neural disease and intervene early. What if you're elderly and you still want to enjoy life to the fullest? You know, the older you get, the higher the probability for multiple morbidities, chronic diseases. But you still feel alive, and you're not ready to leave life yet. So you get the flow. We started from the tiniest little baby to an, uh, a young woman, my daughter, to a guy in his late 30s, um, to an elderly person, and now an elderly person that still wants to enjoy life. So what you see her wearing is a lifeline pendant. So that pendant will detect a fall. It's actually the smallest mobile phone in the world because when she falls, we will contact her, start talking to her, but we can also assess the fall and organize emergency care. But guess what? We can now predict that fall. So how do we do that? We know our clinical background and we know our risks of falling, then we see that in the last couple of days, her gait has changed. She was getting up more slowly. You know, she moved around more slowly. Combined with other vital signs information, that's an indicator. So now we can apply therapy to help her avoid a fall. And 65% of the falls of elderly people may be fatal. What if that happens in her home? and there's nobody around, and she's been lying there for a day without being able, able to provide care. And that's the stuff we can do today. This is a product that's out there that's using artificial intelligence to actually predict the fall, intervene before a fall happens, but if a fall happens, to be there on time. So what we're doing is not just predicting life-threatening falls. We're starting to predict cardiac arrest. So what you see here is a woman with a patch. This patch actually tracks seven vital signs wherever you are. Respiratory rate, um, heart rate, heart rhythm, temperature, SpO2, and it can actually also detect that same fall. So what we start seeing is subtle changes in vital signs in the context of your profile that may indicate cardiac arrest 
So these changes happen 48 hours before the actual cardiac arrest happens. So we have a 48 window to intervene. We have a 48 window to avoid cardiac arrest. We do this for sepsis. We do this for other potentially acute, life-threatening um, life threatening situations. And you see a patch here. What we're going to do next is actually what we call our health dot, which is a tiny little chip that we attach to your skin that will do the same, very non-intrusive, always there 24-7. So where is this all leading? So I talked about the digital twin that will be critical to have that deep understanding of you, that deep understanding of where you're coming from and where you may be going and how we can help you on the path to where you want to go. But we're also looking at what we call ambient intelligence. What if these devices become integrated into the environment? We're already having patient monitors that know who you are, why you're in the hospital, and that automatically configure to you. These monitors are connected to the ceiling in the intensive care unit so that we can create an environment that you're watching that can soothe you when you have a risk of uh, trauma, that can create an environment that can cheer you up when needed or that can stimulate it when needed, that knows that when the nurse comes in that the information on the screen changes from something that she can use in the way she deals with you, that's embedded, integrated into the environment. It's context aware, it's highly personal, and most importantly, it starts predicting. And give you, let me give you an example here. If you undergo radiation for uh, cancer treatment, you have to lie very still, because otherwise the beam will hit the wrong spot. Now, it's very hard to lie still even when you're sedated. What if we use artificial intelligence to predict where the beam will hit once it hit it? So you can adjust the beam to be extremely precise in hitting the cancer in the right spot. That's where we use artificial intelligence. That's what I call adaptive anticipatory and then the way we will integrate and con converse with these devices will be increasingly natural. Voice, touch, so we're developing an ultrasound that reacts to your touch and that can optimize the way we take an image. So all of this will really enable us to create healthcare that's different than today, always on a longer, allowing a longer and healthier lives in a new system that's proactive instead of reactive, that's precise and highly personalized, that's always on like your chronic disease. That's holistic and coordinated among the specialists that can sit anywhere around the world and is everyday based on actionable insights of these terabytes of data that you will carry with you one day. And it will allow us to give my daughter a better life, to give Joost and his son a better life and to help all of us you know, live the lives we earn to live. Thank you.